ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزدنا علما اللهم لا سهل الا ما جعلته سهلا وانت تجعل الحزن اذا شئت سهلا اللهم اجعل عملنا كله صالحا وليوجهك خالصا ولا تجعل لي احد فيه شيئا This is lesson number 43 from the lessons looking at the short surahs of the Quran we are in week 7 of the 10 week course in for the summer alhamdulillah by Allah's permission before the break we were able to complete surah al-fajr and inshallah this evening we'll be beginning with surah Surah Al-Ghashiyah, the covering of the or the overwhelming event. Um, <clears throat> the major theme of Surah Al-Ghashiyah uh, is that it looks at the situation of people in the hereafter and the causes of why people were in each situation. So there are two main situations, as Imam Sa'id is going to. mentioned in the very beginning which is that people will either be in jannah or they will be in hell and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of his mercy he made each of those have causes and so Allah explains in this surah he explains in the rewards and punishments of each group which encourages a person to strive to be from the people of jannah may allah make us and our families and those that we love from the believers amongst them and which deters a person from being from the people of the fire may allah save us and our families from being from the people of the of the fire those that we love from the believers may he save us all from being from the people of the fire and he also lets us know and this is also from his mercy and this is why the quran is a mercy He lets us know what are the actions that will cause a person to be from the people of Jannah and what are the actions that will cause a person to be from the people of Jahannam. Wa salam to Rabbika. So the first thing that where I'd like to start before actually going into the surah is I'd, I'd like to take a few moments if you have the uh, study guide um, study guide for lesson number 43 if you look on the back side of the page Uh, we have some ayat and a hadith uh, we want to look at the first seven ayat or whatever we can cover in the first uh, seven minutes and then we need to get started so that we can hopefully get through this uh, today but what 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 I, we want to emphasize here is the importance of the importance of reading about and contemplating on the hereafter from the from the shortcomings of many muslims in this day and time is that we don't read and reflect on the hereafter enough the quran is replete is full of reminders and details about what the hereafter will be like what jannah will be like what jahannam will be like what the conversation between the people of jannah will be what the conversation between the people of hell will be what the conversation between the people of jannah and the people of hell will be allah gives details about the hereafter so that we can see it with our hearts and so that we can believe that it's true and so we need to make time where we sit alone and we contemplate jannah and imagine ourselves being there and then working to get there and where we imagine jahannam and what it might be like to be there and striving to do whatever we can with the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in both situations 
but in this particular instance, to ask Allah to, to, to get Allah's help to save us from being, from being there. So ayat number one, this is on the back side of the page of the study guide. Uh, it's from Surah Al-Mu'minun, chapter number 23 of the Quran, verses 73 and 74. Allah says, وَإِنَّكَ لَتَدْعُوهُمْ إِلَى صِرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ إِلَى صِرَاطِ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ وَإِنَّ الَّذِينَ لَا يُؤْمِنُونَ بِالْآخِرَةِ عَنِ الصِّرَاطِ لَنَاكِبُونَ And indeed you invite them to a straight path. But those who do not believe in the hereafter are deviating from the path. So what effect, what impact does not believing in the hereafter have on an individual? They're moving away from the straight path. They're moving away from the Surat al-Mustaqeem. The more a person thinks about the hereafter, then the more a person's going to be on the straight path because it's going to be a reality for him. And the more a person doesn't think about the hereafter, then the more they're going to be doing those things that are not going to benefit them. And is this only for the hereafter and Jannah and things related to belief? No. And if a person wants to be successful, if, if he has a lot of work to do to be successful, then one of the motivators for him to be successful is what? Is to, is to imagine, is to keep in mind what success looks like. I mean, again, when you, a, a, a student is working hard in college, for what? For the life that he's imagined in his mind that he's going to have if he graduates. A boxer trains, right, Brother Silly? A boxer trains, why? To imagine himself wearing the belt and being a champion. That, that's, that's what the run in and the grind, day in and day out, staying away from the party, staying away from this, when everyone else is having a good time. What keeps me from being like everybody else? Because I got a vision in my head of what success looks like, and I want to get there. And so we have to transfer that. It can't, that can't just be for the dunya. And a person works hard in a low position. Why? Because they imagine themselves being the manager, being in charge, being comfortable. A person works hard at a job he may not like because he imagines retiring. What it's going to be like when I don't have to work anymore, I can just enjoy things, I'm going to have a certain amount of income, then I can go here and I can go there, I can go fishing, I can take trips. You know, they imagine what the future is going to be like and that's the push to what? To keep working. And that's what we need. We have to have that picture in our minds so that we keep working for the hereafter. And ayat, uh, the next ayat, number two, uh, Allah says, This is a book which we have sent down, blessed, confirming what was before it that you may warn the mother of cities, Mecca, and those around it. And those who believe in the hereafter, believe in it. Believe in what? The Quran. Any a person's belief in the hereafter gives them greater certainty in everything else that's in the Quran. Because their belief in the hereafter is based upon what? Their belief in the Quran and their belief in the Messenger. If they believe in the hereafter, what Allah mentions about that, they're going to believe everything else. And what else are they going to do? They're going to keep up with their prayers. Those who believe. Look at how Allah puts everything on what? The belief in the hereafter. Those who believe in the hereafter, they're going to believe what's in this Quran. And believing what's in the Quran means they're going to what? Act on it. Those who believe in the hereafter are going to implement the directives that Allah gives them in the Quran. They're going to believe that Allah's promise is true. They're going to be patient. They're going to do all the hard work that needs to be done. And from the most important work that they have to do is holding on to their prayers. No. Number three, in Surah Naba, chapter number 78 of the Quran, لا يذوقون فيها بردن ولا شرابا. They will not taste any coolness or drink in hell. إلا حميما وغساقا جزاء وفاقا إنهم كانوا لا يرجون حسابا وكذبوا بآياتنا كذابا. They will not taste therein any coolness or drink except scalding water and pus. A'udhu Billah. 
an appropriate reward, re recompense. That's what they deserve. That it, Allah did not give them two, more than they deserve. That's exactly what they deserve. Why do they deserve it? Because they did not fear being taken to account. They didn't fear standing in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And because of that, they denied our ayat. And so denying the hereafter did what? It corrupted their actions because they didn't believe, they didn't fear being held accountable for their actions. So what? So they did whatever they wanted to do. Number four, Musa said, وَقَالَ Musa, the Surah Ghafr, chapter, uh, chapter number 40, verse 27, وَقَالَ Musa, إِنِّي عُثْتُ بِرَبِّي وَرَبِّكُمْ مِنْ كُلِّ مُتَكَبِّرٍ لَا يُؤْمِنُ بِيَوْمَ الْحِسَابِ Musa said, I seek refuge in my Lord and your Lord from every arrogant person who does not believe in the day of account. So here, not believing in the day of account is tied to what? Arrogance. If a person wants, sees arrogance in himself and wants to be humble, then he has to do what? He has to focus on learning more about the hereafter because that's humbling. And in Surah Al-Muddathir, chapter number 74 of the Quran, قَالُوا مَا سَلَكُكُمْ فِي سَقَرْ What caused you to enter hell? What got you in the position in the first place? قَالُوا لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ They said we did not used to pray. What would have helped them pray? Believe it in here after like we just saw. لَمْ نَكُمْ مِنَ الْمُصَلِّينَ وَلَمْ نَكُمْ نُطْعِمُ الْمِسْكِينَ And we didn't used to feed the poor. We saw those in the previous surahs that we covered. وَكُنَّا نَخُوضُ مَعَ الْخَائِذِينَ We used to waste our time talking about things that had no benefit. وَكُنَّا نُكَذِّبُ بِيَوْمِ الدِّينَ And we used to deny the day of recompense حَتَّى أَتَانَ الْيَقِينَ Until we died. Until death came to us. And so from the reasons why they will mention that they entered in hell was not believing in the hereafter, which affected everything else that they did. They wasted their time. They didn't pray. They didn't feed the poor. Why? Because they didn't think that they, those things mattered. Because they weren't, it wasn't on the radar. Number six, well in, oh, we already mentioned that one. We mentioned that already. Number seven, Surah Al-Ma'un. Have you not seen the one who denies the day of judgment? That's the one who pushes away the orphan. He doesn't feed the poor. Who? The one who denies the day of judgment. So the day of judgment is tied to these actions. Woe to those who pray. They're heedless about their prayer. And they show off when they pray. Why don't they give importance to their prayer? Because they don't believe in the day of judgment. And they, they're stingy with, with simple stuff. Why? Because they don't believe in the hereafter. So the point is what? Reading over and over again about the hereafter is important to our souls. From the things that will help us to be better and to improve is to give more attention to the book of Allah and those ayats that deal with the hereafter and to contemplate on those ayats. And from those surahs that address the hereafter is Surah al ghashiyah which we'll be looking at today. Uh, Surah al ghashiyah um, gives little detail. It, 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 it has minimized detail about what happens to the people of hell. And it goes into much more detail about what happens to the people of Jannah. And you'll find that some ayat or surahs are different. Where they'll go into a little detail about the people of, the people of Jannah. And then they'll give lots of detail about the people of hell. Like Surah Al-Mursalat, the, the, the chapter just before Juz Amma. The chapter just before Juz Amma, Surah Al-Mursalat, there's lots of detail about the people in hell and the people who are going to be punished. And then Allah says, like right near the end, إِنَّ الْمُتَّقِينَ فِي ظِلَالٍ وَعُيُونَ The believers will be in shade and with rivers. وَفَوَاكِهَ مِمَّا يَشْتَهُونَ And fruit from what they desire. كُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا هَنِيئًا بِمَا كُنْتُمْ تَعْمَلُونَ Eat and drink comfortably because of what you used to do. This is the way that we reward those who did excellent. Woe to those who deny. And then he goes back into details about those who deny. The whole surah, you keep hearing, Woe to those who deny. Woe to those who deny. Lots of details about those who deny. Very few details about those who 
believed. So, you know, this is, you know, and then sometimes you find uh, it goes both ways where there's, uh, Allah mentions an ayat about the punishment and then an ayat about reward and so on. But this sort of gives a lot more attention to what happens to those who believe. And so it's one of those surahs that is an encourager. If we understand it, think about it, which is again why a person should make time to read and reflect. A person, if they have the ability, should invest in a good tafsir from the best amongst them. Uh, alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed someone uh, or some team to work on tafsir and kathir. Even if it's abridged, it's something. And it's not bad. MashaAllah, it's not bad. You know, most of the important things they captured by Allah's permission, uh, translating that. And then as well, tafsir al-si'di, two versions. Uh, two versions of that tafsir. I prefer the four-volume version, but the ten-volume version, ten version, lots of bets. No, no harm in it. Type Allah subhanahu wa taala says, or the the halataka hadith al ghashia wujuhun yoma idin ghashia amilatun nasiba tasla na naran hamia tusqa min ain an ania leisa lahum taamun illa min dariya la yusmin wa la yugni min jur wujuhun yoma idin naima li saiha radia fi jannatin alia la tasma u fiha lagia fiha ain un jaria fiha surun mawdua فيها سرر مرفوعة وأكواب موضوعة ونمارق مصفوفة وزرابي مبثوثة. Now, uh, so we'll begin and we'll translate those ayats as we move along. So in the beginning, he says, يذكر تعالى أحوال يوم القيامة وما فيها من الأحوال الطامة. He says Allah subhanahu wa taala mentions the circumstances of the day of judgment and the different horrific, uh, overwhelming hor horrors that will be uh, on that day. The different overwhelming horrors that will be on that day. And that's where the term al-ghashya comes from because ghashya is to overshadow or to cover. And so uh, he says, وَأَنَّهَا تَغْشَى الْخَلَائِقْ بِشَدَائِدِهَا And so the day of judgment is going to cover and overwhelm people, the creation with its difficulties and with its hardships uh, people will be rewarded according to their actions and again just to highlight again this is from Allah's justice Allah already knows Allah already knows who's going to Jannah who's going to Jahannam he knows it it's already written it's in a book why didn't he just judge us based upon what he knows? Because he, he wants to establish the evidence. He's giving you a chance to show. He wants you to see and me to see our own actions. So that when we end up where we end up, we either, as he says in the, in the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, whoever finds good, let him thank Allah because Allah helped him. Or man wajida duna dhalik, whoever finds less than that, other than that, yani, yani the punishment, فَلَا illa إِلَّا nafsa. And let him not blame anyone but himself. He's the one that did it to himself. Everyone had a chance to act. And Allah is going to judge you. Allah says in Surah Yasin, You will not be rewarded except by what you did. Not by what Allah knew. By what you did. Everything is what you did. And so this is from Allah's just, uh, justice and his kindness and his mercy. If he judges based upon what he knew, he'd still be just. Because he's judging us based upon what he knew from us. But he gives us a chance to see it for ourselves. And the creation and the earth and our hands and our feet and the people around us and the walls will testify to exactly what occurred. May Allah protect us from the evil of ourselves. He says, And they will be distinguished and separated into two groups. There's two groups, is not a third. A group. In Jannah and a group in the burning fire. And subhanAllah, you'll find that Imam al Sa'idi in his tafsir of Surah Al Ghashiyah, uh, he makes subtle references to other places in the Quran that mention the Day of Judgment. And I found in some of those instances that he actually goes into detail about what he talks about here briefly in Surah Al Ghashiyah. So here, when he says, Fariqun fil Jannah, and Fariqun fi Sa'ir, that's taken from Surati Ashura, chapter number 42 of the Quran. Uh, in the early ayat of Surati Shura, chapter number 42, Allah says, 
وَلِيُنْذِرْ يَوْمَ الْجَمْعِ لَا رَيْبَ فِي To warn of the day of gathering, the day of collecting, uh, there's no doubt about it. فَرِيقٌ فِي الْجَنَّةِ وَفَرِيقٌ فِي السَّعِيرِ uh, A group will be in Jannah and a group will be in the blazing fire. May Allah make us from the group that's in Jannah and save us from freeing from the group that's in the blazing fire. He says, فَأَخْبَرَ عَنْ وَصْفِ كُلِ الْفَرِيقَيْنِ And so he informs us of the description the qualities, the characteristics of each group. Why is he telling us about the qualities of each group? To let us know what we need to do and what we not need to not do. Absolutely. To let us know. If you do these actions, this is where you can expect to end up. If you do these actions, this is where you can expect to end up. He says, فَقَالَ فِي وَصْفِ أَهْلِ النَّارِ he says in describing the people of the, of the fire, وُجُوهُنْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ Faces on that day, أَيْ يَوْمَ القيامة, On the day of judgment, خَاشِعَ They're going to be lowly. خَاشِعَ مِنَ الظُّلِّ وَالْفَضِيحَةِ وَالْخِزِ يعني They will be lowly, they will be humbled. مِنَ الظُّلِّ From lowliness. وَالْفَضِيحَ And disgrace. وَالْخِزِ and humiliation. Faces will be humbled on that day. They didn't have any khushur in the dunya. And so they're going to have khushur in the hereafter. The khushur in the dunya is a wonderful thing. The khushur in the hereafter is not. Wujuhun yawma idhin khashi'ah. Their faces are going to be khashi'ah. Because they weren't khashi'ah in the dunya. They were supposed to be khashi'ah in the dunya. They weren't khashi'ah in the dunya. So they're going to be khashi'ah in the hereafter. But what is that khashi'ah going to be? It's going to be the khashi'ah, the khushua of lowliness, of disgrace, of humiliation. That's why their faces are going to be low and humbled on that day. Not humbled out of awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were arrogant in the dunya. They're going to be humbled because, because of the humiliation and the disgrace and the lowliness they deserve. May Allah save us from being amongst them. Wujuhun yawma idhin khashi'a amilatun nasiba. Working, tired. Working, worn out. On that day, the faces and the bodies that follow them will be Working and worn out, fatigued, tired. He says, I ta'iba fil adab. Is going to be tired from punishment. Allahu Akbar. Tired from punishment. To jarru ala wujuhihim. They will be dragged on their faces. That's going to be a part of their humiliation and their disgrace and their lowliness. They wouldn't put their faces on the ground to make sajda. And so their faces are going to be dragged on the ground. What, 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 what I want us to see, whenever Allah gives a punishment, a part of what we should be thinking about is how does the punishment match the crime? As Allah says in Surah An-Naba, as we read earlier, Jaza'an wifaqa. They get an appropriate punishment. Allah doesn't oppress anybody. They're going to get the punishment. I'm saying they because I'm asking Allah not to make me, not to make you from them. They're going to get a punishment. This is hope. <laughs> They're going to get a punishment uh, that matches the crime that they did. A part of that crime is that what? They're going to say when they entered hell, what caused you to enter hell? We didn't used to pray. We didn't put our faces on the ground, humbling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so now your face is going to be dragged on the ground. That's what you get. You, you were supposed to prostrate. You didn't do it. Which shows the danger of not praying. The danger of not praying. You're supposed to be working hard in the dunya to please Allah. Didn't do it. So you're going to be working hard in hell. Worn out in hell. Allah save us from it. To jarru ala wujuhim, dragged on their faces. He says, now the fire will cover their faces. This ayat that he mentions here comes from Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14 of the Quran. Surah Bilahum min Qatiranin 
وَتَغْشَى وُجُوهَهُمُ النَّارِ Their clothing will be from قَطِرًا Something like tar, which ignites very easily. Their clothes will be from that. And their faces will be covered with fire. Why do they deserve for their bodies to experience pain all over? Because they enjoyed the blessings of Allah in every single way and they didn't thank him for it. They experienced the pleasures of this dunya, all the pleasures of this dunya, and they did not show gratitude for it. And so they deserve, as a result, to experience no pleasure, to experience pain for the pleasure that they took without right. Nothing is free. Uh, that's what they take in this dunya. Nothing in life is free. And nothing in the hereafter is free either. Allah is Ar-Rahman. And the hereafter ain't free. Allah is Ar-Rahman. And the hereafter is not free. As come in the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Inna sil'at Allahi ghaliya. The commodity that Allah is selling is expensive. Inna sil'at Allah al-Jannah. The commodity that Allah is selling is Jannah. Jannah is not free. And Allah is the most merciful. He's the kindest. Akram or uh, al akram. And your Lord is the most kind. But Jannah is not free. Huh? Nothing in life is free. That's what, that's what they tell us here. Nothing in the hereafter is free either. You got to pay for it. It's got a cost to it. No. And so because they didn't pay the price for it. In this dunya, they're going to pay the price in the hereafter. You can't, you can't enjoy the pleasures of this dunya and you don't pay for it. You got to pay the dues for it. No. And that's why, again, that's why any you know, people say, I can't imagine a God who could do punish people in this way. Yeah, Allah says in the Quran, It's going to appear to them on the day of judgment things they didn't imagine Allah, could, Allah was going to do. Just because you can't imagine Allah being that way don't mean they say that way. He's not, Allah is not a figment of your imagination. Allah has sent messengers to make this thing clear. You have a principle for life. Nothing in life is free. Nothing hereafter is free. Whatever you take in this dunya, you take with a cost. And so if a person enjoys the pleasures of this dunya, then he does so within the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he pays the price for it. What's the price for it? Worship Allah and don't commit shirk. In the hadith of Anas ibn Malik, radiallahu anhu, collected in Sahih Bukhari, the, the Prophet ﷺ mentions, يَقُولُ اللَّهُ تَعَالَى لِأَهْوَنِ أَهْلِ النَّارِ Allah will say to the person with the least punishment in hell, لَوْ كَانَ لَكَ مَا فِي الْأَرْضِ جَمِيعًا هَلْ تَفْتَدِي بِهِ مِنَ الْعَذَابِ If you had everything in this dunya, would you ransom it to save your soul? What do you think the, low, the person in the lowest punishment in hell will say? No or yes? yes? Would you give everything up in this world to save yourself from this punishment? Yes. Allah will say to that person, I asked you for less than that. I asked you for less than that. I didn't ask you to give me the whole world. I asked you when you were in the loins of your father Adam to worship me and not commit shirk. But you refused. But you refused. If you had the whole world and everything in it, would you use it to save yourself? Would you give it up to save yourself from the lowest punishment in hell? The person going to say yes. Allah is going to tell that person, I, ask, I didn't ask you for the whole world. Allahu Akbar. Huh? Allah didn't ask you for 24 hours. One hour, give it to him for prayer. 10 minutes for Fajr, 10 minutes for, 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 for Dhuhr, 10 minutes for Asr, 10 minutes for Maghrib, 10 minutes for Isha. Pray your five daily prayers. You can't give Allah one hour or 24. He didn't ask for all your time. What Allah asks us for is very little. And we're stingy with that. And so, you don't have to believe in a Lord that punishes. He, he, he's, he, he has informed us about himself and what he's going to do on the day of judgment. 
And so a person who understands that is going to work. Nothing in life is free and nothing in the hereafter is free. Whatever a person takes of this dunya, it comes with a cost. And that cost is shukr. That cost is gratitude. And how do we show gratitude? By doing what Allah says. Will you stand for your children to disrespect you in your house? And you pay the bills and you buy the food and you give the heat and the air. Are you going to stand in your home to be disrespected? Absolutely not. You're going to follow my way. You're going to get out of my house. Absolutely. And would anybody think that that's oppressive? Absolutely not. Allah lets us stay <laughs> in his earth and we disrespect him. Allah lets us, he doesn't kick us out. He lets us stay here, disrespecting him to his face. And he said, in the point of time, when that time comes, if you've done what you're supposed to do, you got good coming. You didn't do what you're supposed to do, did it to yourself. May Allah save us. May Allah help us to stop wasting our time with uh, Facebook and Instagram and YouTube and TV and HBO and Cinemax and Showtime and all that other stuff, huh? Get busy. Get busy working. Allah help us. No. No. Amina to Nasiba. Any tired from punishment, dragged on their faces in hell. Taqsha wujuhu humunar. Their faces are covered with the fire. May Allah save us from that. He says, وَيُحْتَمَلْ أَنِ الْمُرَادِ بِقَوْلِهِ وُجُوهٌ يَوْمَئِذٍ خَاشِيَةٌ عَامِلَةٌ to nasiba. It's also possible that what's meant by this, yani, that their faces, uh, that they will be tired, uh, that their faces will be humbled, working hard and tired. He says it's also possible that this means fi dunya likoni him fi dunya ahlu ibadat. He says it's also possible that what's meant by them being humbled and worn out and tired, working and tired, is that in the dunya, they were people who were worshipping and doing actions. وَلَكِنَّهُ لَمَّا عَدِمَ شَرْتُهُ وَهُوَ الْإِيمَانِ صَرَ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ هَبَاءً مَنْثُورًا But when they did not fulfill the condition of their actions being accepted, which is iman, then all the work that they did was lost. And so here he's saying that this ayah could be referring to there are certain people in the dunya who are religious. And so they give charity and they pray in whatever way that they do and they strive to be good people and do good in the earth and stay away from those things that they believe are forbidden. But because they don't have iman, then all of that work that they did was meaningless. Why was it meaningless? Because they did it how they wanted to do it. They didn't do it how Allah wanted them to do it. They didn't believe in what Allah said they had to believe in in order for those actions to be accepted, which is to have Iman. Yani Iman as he has legislated in terms of himself, in terms of the Day of Judgment, in terms of his messengers. So what they did was lost and meaningless. This was the foundational, the foundational condition of acceptance, which is Iman. A person has to be a believer in order for his deeds to be accepted. And then after that, for each individual action a person does, there are two conditions, which are what? Intention and upon the Sunnah, compliance. Intention and compliance. You have to do it for the right reason. And you have to do it according to the proper example, the proper model, which is the model of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Even a Muslim won't have his deeds accepted unless they fit those two criteria. So we have the overall criteria for acceptance, which is Iman. You have to be a believer. You have to testify to La ilaha illallah and Muhammad Rasulullah. And then the second and after that, each individual action must be done for the sake of Allah and must be done in accordance with the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. And so they worked hard in worshipping as they defined worship, but it wasn't accepted from them because they did not have the condition for that. 
Imam Sa'di then says, وَحَاذَ الْإِحْتِمَالُ وَإِنْ كَانَ صَحِيهًا مِنْ حَيْثُ الْمَعْنَى فَلَا يَدُولُ عَلَيْهِ سِيَاقُ الْكَلَامِ He says, this second possibility of this referring to people who held other, who were members of other religions, who may have worked hard in worshiping and had those deeds rejected because they did not have the proper iman. He said, even though that's true, that they are working hard for nothing, that's true in terms of the meaning, this is not the proper tafsir of the ayat. And so that's a very important point that Imam al-Si'idi is mentioning here and that he's going to give us evidence for, which is that any person may read an ayat and a mean, the meaning may be true that they understand but that's not the tafsir that's not the tafsir that's not the intended meaning of the ayat how do we know the intended meaning of the ayat because we look at what the prophet sallallahu and his companions and the scholars of tafsir have mentioned and so from those common examples what, what is the, the common examples uh, Allah mentions in Surah T? Inna Allah la yughayru ma biqawmin hatta yughayru ma bi anfusihim. Allah does not change the condition of a people until they change their own condition. What does that mean? Most people believe, or many people that I've spoken to, I won't say most people, I don't know most people. Many people that I've heard who talk about that ayat, what they say that it means is, if you want Allah to help you, then you have to make some effort. Allah's not going to change your condition, yani from bad to good, until you begin to work to strive to change that condition yourself. Well, the meaning has some truth to it. If a person wants Allah to help them, then that person has to strive. The person has to can't just make dua, but the person has to make some real effort to try to change. Even if it's making du'a more, moving away from those negative situations that cause them to keep falling into sins, striving to be a better worshiper of Allah, that's true. But that's not what the ayat means. Allah explains what that ayat means in Surah Al-Anfal, chapter number 8 of the Quran. That ayat is mentioned in Surah In Surah Tirat, that ayat comes from Surah Tirat, the one that we mentioned, just mentioned. Allah doesn't change the condition of a people until they change their own condition. That's in chapter number 13 of the Quran. The tafsir of that is in Surah Anfal, chapter number 8 of the Quran. Allah says, ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يُغَيِّرُ نِعْمَةً أَنْعَمَهَا عَلَىٰ قَوْمٍ حَتَّى يُغَيِّرُ مَا بِأَنفُسِهِمْ Allah doesn't take away a blessing that He's blessed a person with until they change themselves. And so Allah doesn't change the condition of a people. Allah's not going to take someone's iman and someone's goodness and the hard work that someone has done until that person himself changes. He stops doing what he's supposed to do. The person falls into sin. The person disobeys Allah. The person mistreats people. And so because of that, the blessings of Allah that the person had gets what? Get taken away. That's what the ayat means. But is it true that a person, if they want Allah to help them, that they have to make some type of effort? Yes, that's true. But that's not the tafsir of the ayat. And so a person may read an ayat of the Quran and take away an understanding. That's not the understanding. The meaning might still be true, but that's not the tafsir. That's not what Allah intended by his words. That's what tafsir is. Tafsir is understanding Allah's words as he intended them not as you understand them. Not as you and I understand them. And in order, for, in order to make sure that his words were crystal clear, Allah did what? Sent a messenger to explain. To explain to people what has been revealed to them. But we have to look at the sunnah of the Prophet No, Allah says in, in Surah Al-Baqarah, وَيَسْأَلُونَكَ عَنِ الْمَحِيدِ قُلْ هُوَ أَذَا فَاعْتَزِلُوا النِّسَاءَ فِي الْمَحِيدِ They ask you about menstruation, about menstruation. 
say it is any harmful, it is filthy. So stay away from women. Stay away from women when they menstruate. Type. Does that mean that when a woman menstruates that you should sleep in a different room? Shouldn't eat with her? Shouldn't sit with her? Don't spend any time with her? Is that what we understand? Shaking your head. Allah says stay away from women when they menstruate. Isn't that clear? It says stay away from women. When she's menstruating, stay away from her, right? That's what we understand from her, right? Say, no, we don't want to do that one. Huh? No. How do, how do we know that's not the tafsir? Because that's not how the Prophet system explained it. That's not his practice. When the women in his, his household menstruated, he didn't go into another room. He didn't stop eating with them. He didn't stop laying in the same bed with them. It means what? Stay away from intercourse. Stay away from sexual intercourse. It doesn't even mean that you can't have some type of intimacy. It just means you have to stay away from the place where the menstruation comes from. That's what you have to avoid. That's what that ayat means. How do we understand that? We understand it from the practice of the Prophet ﷺ. And so again, a person may take away something true, but it's not the tafsir of the ayat. And the person may take away something completely false. And it's not the tafsir of the ayat, which is why what? No matter how much Arabic a person knows, he still depends on the tafsir, any books of tafsir, the tafsir of the scholars, to a degree. Because the tafsir of the scholars, it in, it like Ibn Kathir, like Imam Sa'di, it contains within it, At-Tabari, Ibn Atiyah, it contains within it what the Prophet ﷺ has said, what the companions have said, what the tabi'een have said, and also other possible interpretations that have been taken away from by the scholars of Islam. Now, so he says, so this second understanding that those who follow other religions and work hard in those other religions, that their work is meaningless, that they are tired and worn out for no good reason, for no beneficial reason. He says, even though the meaning of this is sahih, because their deeds are not going to be accepted, this is not what these ayats indicate. So you got, does he have some evidence for this? Absolutely he does. He says, Bela sawab al maqtubihi. He says, the correct opinion, which is absolutely positively true, there's no doubt about it, is that this refers to the people of hell. The people of hell will be lowly, disgraced, worn out, tired, working in hell. That's what this means. It does not mean the second one. He says, number one, لِأَنَّهُ قَيَّدَهُ بِذَرْفِ he says, because he's talking about them being this way when? On the day of judgment. Faces on that day will be humbled, working, tired, worn out on that day. He says, so because it's saying on that day, that's letting us know this is not talking about the dunya. This is talking about the hereafter. He says, وَهُوَ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ So he's talking about the dharf. The dharf is an adverb, and it's something that refers to time or place, something that answers the question how or when or where or how often, how long, to what extent. Uh, where and when, though often, a dharf, is, a dharf refers to a place or a time. So here we have a time reference which is on that day. He says, وَهُوَ يَوْمُ الْقِيَامَةِ Which is the day of judgment. He says, وَلِأَنَّهُ This is the second reason. وَلِأَنَّهُ الْمَقْصُودُ هُنَا Because this is intended here. لِأَنَّ الْمَقْصُودُ هُنَا Because what's intended here بَيَانُ ذِكْرِ أَهْلِ النَّارِ عُمُومًا Allah is mentioning the punishment of the people of hell in general. He's not mentioning the, 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 the Christians or the Jews or, or Buddhists or whoever else is doing some work. He's not mentioning any specific religious group here. He's talking about the disbelievers in general. They're all going to be this way. And if they refuse to, 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 to accept belief according to his criteria, he says, Those people who are working hard, really trying to worship Allah, if we were to take that group of people and to measure them against the rest of the disbelievers, what percentage of those who disbelief, are working hard trying to please Allah in their disbelief. 
Very few. There's very few disbelievers who are like wearing themselves out tired trying to please Allah. He says, so they, they, they're so small, they're not even worth any you know, mentioning you know, in, in, in isolation. He says, Juzan Khalil and Binisbatila Ahlin Nah, they're a small portion of the people of the fire. He says, Well, he al kalam fi bayani hal al nasi in the Rashiyan al Rashiya. He says, and also, this is the third reason, because here what Allah is talking about is how people will be when the horrors of the day of judgment first fall. When people are first overwhelmed, when their hearts and their faces are overwhelmed with the horrors of the day of judgment, then this is how their situation is going to be. When they are completely overwhelmed by these horrors. He says, There's no, there's no indication at all in any of these preliminary ayat, these beginning ayat, that there's any reference to their situation in the dunya. Now, and this reminds us, this reminds us of what we talked about in Surah Al-Balad, where Allah talks about him creating people, mankind, in Al-Kabad. لَقَدَ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ We created mankind in Kebet. What do we say was Kebet? Man was created in Kebet. What's Kebet? Difficulty, hardship. That his whole life is one hardship after the other. And if he doesn't work hard in this dunya to save himself, then what's going to happen? It's going to continue to be a hardship until the day of judgment. We said that that was one of the tafsir of of, according to Imam Sa'di, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ That life is difficult all the way through, from beginning to end. And if man doesn't work hard to save himself, to get some salvation by the permission of Allah, then it's going to continue to be hard forever, and that's what's being described here. So what's going to happen to this person who's humiliated by Allah? May Allah save us from being amongst them. He says, تَصْلَى نَارًا حَامِيَا he will enter, Tasla, he will enter and endure. He will enter and have to bear. Now run Hamia. A hot fire. He says, Shadidun har, Shadidan Haruha. Yani, very severe is its heat. To he to be him min kulli makan. It will surround them from all sides. They will be given water from a hot spring. Not, not, not the nice ones, huh? From, from hot rivers. I shadida tul harara. Extremely hot. Extremely hot. He says, وَإِن يَسْتَغِيثُ He's now referencing another ayat from Surah Al-Kaf. When, they, when they're when they so hot that they ask for help, they ask for relief, they will be given relief with water like molten lead, hot. You can't get away from the heat. You need something liquid that's hot gets on you, like oil, can't get it off. Yeshwi al wuju, it will roast their faces. Hada sharabuhum, this is what they will drink. They will experience pleasure, excuse me, displeasure, discomfort, pain, and torment from the outside and the inside. They will endure a hot fire and it will burn their outsides. And they will drink hot boiling liquid on the inside. And this is what you're seeing. Pain on the outside, pain on the inside. Extreme pain on both, both sides, inside and outside. Why? Why? Remember, the punishment goes with the actions. Why? Why do they get punished like this? Extreme punishment inside and outside. Why is this not horrific and torturous and unfair? Why? Why, why is this just? They enjoyed the pleasures of this dunya, inside and outside. They ate in this country, 
three square meals a day in snacks. How many grapes did they eat? Blueberries, strawberries, lemons, oranges, mangoes, one after the other, making them feel good and satisfied inside. And did they ever say thank you, Allah? No. Nah. They enjoyed the pleasures inside and outside of their body. Haram pleasures, halal pleasures. They felt good inside, tingled on the inside and on the outside. And they didn't thank Allah. And they transgressed his boundaries. And they felt good on the outside. They had an air conditioning turn on to make themselves cool when it was hot. They had the shade of a tree to enjoy. They had cool water to swim in, day in and day out, and never thanked Allah. Had they lived forever, they would have what? Enjoyed these pleasures forever and not thanked Allah. The only reason it stopped is because Allah has decreed that everything died. And so why are they getting punished inside and outside? Why is that fair? Because you enjoyed and you didn't thank. You know Allah. In your fitrah, you know, you know this stuff didn't come from nowhere. You refused. You see the sun go up and down and up and down. You know it. How does it do it? Allah does it. You know there's a power greater than yourself. You don't submit. How can I thank you, Allah? How, what do you want from me, Allah? That's it. So the, the point is what? Don't feel bad about the punishment. Just strive not to be in it. Don't feel, there's nothing, Allah, if we know Allah and Allah is just, Allah is fair, Allah, is Allah kind? Of course he is. If he wasn't kind, the Kafirs wouldn't do what? Make dua. They wouldn't make dua to him. They get sick, they get scared, they get afraid. The, the, the airplane trembles and they do what? Oh God, save me. The children gets hurt. Oh God, please help him. If you didn't believe in your fitrah that Allah was kind, you wouldn't ask him for anything. Your fitrah testifies to Allah's mercy. And so no Muslim should have any shek, no doubt, any qualms, any discomfort. La raib. There's no discomfort, no, 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 no worries about what's in the book. This is the punishment. Absolutely, positively. And Allah wasn't unfair to anybody. Everybody's going to get exactly what they deserve, except for the people of Jannah. They're going to get Allah's favor because he blessed them to do. They're going to get his favor and they're going to continue to get his mercy. Allah gave everybody his mercy in this dunya. How did he give them mercy? By making them comfortable, sending them messengers, giving them books, giving them a chance, making things clear for them. Everybody shares in the mercy in this dunya. Only the believers are going to continue to get it in the hereafter. Because at least they tried. They acknowledged that Allah had rights. They acknowledged that Allah had rights. And they made some type of effort to fulfill them. So the person, the believer who enters the fire, he's not going to say that. Why not? Because he at least acknowledged, Allah, you have a right to something that I'm not giving you. You have the right to be worshipped. You have the right to be away. I acknowledge it. When I say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, you have the right to be worshipped the way that you choose to be worshipped. And I have the duty to comply to that. At least acknowledging that truth allows him some sense of salvation and striving to fulfill that. But because he didn't fulfill it, then he may be punished. May Allah save us from that. But he has hope of getting out. Why? Because he made the acknowledgement. The Kafir didn't even acknowledge. When it said to them, bow down to the most merciful. Who's the most merciful? God. Who, who's God? I don't know of any God. You're okay. So again, don't feel any qualms about the punishment that we hear in the Quran. Don't, it's all fair. And if you contemplate it, you will see that the, the punishment matches the crime. Your Lord does not oppress anybody. He says, This is their, this is their drink, the hot boiling liquid. As for their food, فَلَيْسَ لَهُمْ طَعَامٌ إِلَّا مِنْ ضَرِيعٍ They will have no food except from ضَرِيعٍ ضَرِيعٍ uh, Some of the scholars of Tirsir said it's a plant called Shibriq uh, It is thorny and inedible when it's uh, fresh 
and it's poisonous when it's dried. And it shares the name, but the reality of how horrid that plant is, is a different reality in the hereafter. He says, It does not nourish and it does not take away hunger. Imam Sirdi says, He says, That's because the purpose behind eating food is one of two. He said, Either it takes away the hunger of the person who eats, that's why the person's eating, so they don't feel hungry. And it takes away the pain of hunger. He says, He says, or either it nourishes his body from being frail and weak and, 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 and malnourished. We can add a third reason any, in this day and time. People eat why? Because it, it, it feels good. Or uh, a fourth reason, because they're, they're bored. A fifth reason, because they're depressed. People eat for all, there's so much food, so plentiful food that people eat for all types of reasons now. And it's one of the things that distracts us, which is why fasting is such a benefit. Because when a person fasts, then because they're not distracted by eating and by the ultimate effects of eating, those effects that we don't like so much, but there are a reason to be grateful. Gufranak, Allah, your forgiveness for our lack of ingratitude, for our lack of gratitude. Huh? It preoccupies food, eating, and, and what results from eating preoccupies a person from worshiping. When a person fasts, they have more time to read the Quran, more time to remember Allah because they're not busy with eating so much. But people eat nowadays for all types of reasons and they're distracted by that eating. May Allah save us from being of those who are distracted by their stomachs and by their intestines. Now, he says, وَهَذَا الطَّعَامِ يَعْنِي the food of, the, of hell it doesn't do any of these two purposes. And it's, it's not going to cure any depression either. It's not going to make you feel good. No. It's not going to nourish, and it's not going to take away any hunger. This food, it's bitter, it's foul, it stinks. It doesn't taste good, it doesn't smell good, and it's of horrible, lowly quality. Yani all of the blessings of the food that we have in this dunya are not going to exist for the food of the hereafter because you ate it day and night and didn't thank Allah for it. And so you, we, the, 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 the person in hell doesn't deserve that Allah take away his hunger. He doesn't deserve that his food nourish him. Why? Because it did it in the dunya and he didn't appreciate. Didn't appreciate Allah's blessings. A person eats probably more than he does anything else. And Allah tells us in Surati, Abasa, فَلْيَنْظُرِ الْإِنسَانُ إِلَىٰ طَعَامِهِ let man look at his food, and his food is an ayat. And his food is an ayat. And as much as he eats, he doesn't thank. No. We ask Allah to save us and protect us from that. Now, now we get on to more positive things, huh? We're done with the people of hell. May we be done with them and never have to be a part of that experience. Neither us nor our families, nor those who we love from amongst the believers. He says, وَجُوهُنْ يَوْمَ إِذَا النَّعِمَةً he says, وَأَمَّا أَهْلَ الْخَيْرِ As for the people of goodness. فَوُجُوهُنْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةً نَعِمَةً Their faces on that day will be na'ima. What does it mean, na'ima? He says, قَدْ جَرَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ نَظْرَةُ النَّعِيمِ You will see on their faces the joy and the splendor and the radiance of comfort. You will see on their faces that they are comfortable and that they are happy. And the happiness on their faces is an extension of the happiness of their hearts. Usually how a person feels inside is what's shown on his face. The face is a reflection oftentimes of the heart. And so when a person is happy in his heart, then you see a smile on his face. And when a person is sad and depressed and miserable inside, then his face is grimaced and frowning and sad. When a person is angry, you see his face, the, 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 the knots at the top of his eyebrows come in and his face becomes tight, just like the tightness of his heart. And so you're going to see comfort and happiness and joy 
on those faces because of the joy and the happiness that they have in their hearts. They're going to feel good on the inside and the outside. A person wants to imagine himself being happy like that and then strive to get there. Now, he says, فَنَظْرَتْ أَبْدَانَهُمْ فَنَظْرَتْ أَبْدَانَهُمْ وَاسْتَنَارَتْ وُجُوهُهُمْ وَسُرُّوا غَايَةِ السُّرُورِ He says their bodies will be glowing, their faces will be radiant and bright, and they will be happier than they could ever have imagined. لِسَعْيِهَا رَاضِيَةً Those faces, those hearts, and those bodies connected to those faces will be pleased with their striving. They're going to be happy for all the hard work that they did. That's the key. What got them there? How did they get happy? Hard work. That's the formula of success that we preach in this dunya. Huh? You want to be successful, you have to do what? Work hard. Some people work hard, they're still not successful. Because they're not given the same opportunities as other people. And everything is by the decree of Allah. But he's also decreed that there's a human element there as well. That they have to be accountable for. Where people get denied opportunities to succeed, and to excel. Because of, because of things that Allah decreed for their circumstances. Where they come from. What they look like. They tell you work hard in this dunya and you'll be successful. That's not true. Because a lot of other factors that are involved. But if you work hard for Allah, you will be successful. Allah is not biased. He's not racist. He's not prejudiced. He's the one that decreed all our nationalities and colors and genders. No. He says, They will be happy. They will be pleased with the effort that they made. And so this shows us that we have to work hard now. If we want to be comfortable later, we want to retire in the hereafter. If we want to retire in the hereafter, we've got to work hard now. Right now is the time to work. Right now is the job. Day in, day out. It's a grind. We're going to get there. He says, Lisa'iha, for its striving, the striving of the people who those faces belong to, he said, الَّذِي قَدَّمَتْهُ فِي الدُّنْيَا مِنَ الْأَعْمَالِ الصَّالِحَةِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ إِلَىٰ عِبَادِ اللَّهِ From the effort that those people put forth in the dunya of doing righteous actions and being kind to the slaves of Allah. The strivings that we do in this dunya, there's the duty that we fulfill to Allah and there's the kindness that we strive to show, the justice at a bare minimum. The justice at a bare minimum and the kindness, if we want to try for extra, that we show to the slaves of Allah. It's not just how you worship Allah. It's how you treat people. We learned that in the hadith from this Friday, from the 40 hadith course. The hadith of Abu Sa'in al-Khudri radiallahu anhu, hadith number 32, la darar wa la dirar. There is to be no harm and no reciprocation of harm. How you treat people will have an effect on your relationship with Allah. It's going to have an effect on the hereafter. A person does righteous deeds and because he hit people and oppressed people and stole from people, then what? They're going to take away his good deeds. No. And so a striving is do what? Strive to do what Allah says and a part of doing what Allah says and striving not to harm people. Striving to be good to people. From the best of people you should be good to is... Mom, dad, siblings, brothers and sisters, those who are closest to you. And subhanAllah, subhanAllah, Allah has decreed that a part of our nature that we have to fight and struggle with is that the people who are closest to us are the hardest people to treat well. It is oftentimes for most human beings that the people who are closest to us are the most difficult people to consistently be good to because we spend the most time around them. The Prophet ﷺ said, The most complete believer as it relates to his Iman is the one who has the best character. 
wa khairukum khairukum li ahli and the best of you is the best to his family and your family could mean family in general could mean spouse the most complete believer in his iman is the one that has the best character and the best of you is the best to his family that hadith is collected in a tirmidhi the hadith of aisha radiyallahu anha a hadith reported from the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam by by one of his wives by one of his wives radiyallahu an and hunna ajma'in nam so this is the sa'i we strive to obey allah and strive to be good to the creation li sa'iha radiya pleased with the hard work that they did i'm glad i put in that effort i'm glad i did those my i got my prayers in five times a day i'm glad i was good to my mother and my sisters and my brothers i'm glad i gave that charity i'm glad i fasted on mondays i'm glad i did extra i'm glad i made time to read the quran and memorize it i'm glad i made time to remember allah in the morning and the evening it's the things that we got to strive to do and if we do we're going to be happy a person could work hard in this dunya not be happy never never taste never taste the sweetness of his hard work but in the hereafter you're going to be pleased with your striving we i won't just include you huh <laughs> we inshallah going to be pleased with our strivings inshallah huh he says radiya idha wajadat thawabahu they're going to be pleased when they find the reward of those actions mudakharan mudha'afan how are those How's that reward going to be for those actions? First is going to be mudakhar. It's going to be preserved and saved. Allah's not going to let anything be lost. فَمَنْ يَعْمَلْ مِثْقَالَ ذَرَّةٍ خَيْرًا يَرَى Whoever did the smallest amount of good, the ants, the smallest ant, whoever did that much good is going to what? See it. It's going to see it. And whoever does the smallest amount of evil is going to see it. We're done talking about the evil. I'm talking about the good. Huh? Whoever does the smallest amount of good is going to see it. There's no effort we make for Allah. No time we shut our mouths and don't say something bad because we fear Allah and it being written down from the angel by the angels. There's no time we strive and fight ourselves for the sake of Allah, except it's going to be written down. We're going to, Allah is going to say that for save that for us. Mudakharan, mudafan. Not only is He going to save it, but He's going to what? Multiply it. You will get more for it than the effort you put in. Allah says at the end of Surah Al-Muzammil, what does He say? وَأَقِيمُوا الصَّلَاةِ وَآتِوا الزَّكَاءِ وَأَقْرِضُوا اللَّهَ قَرْضًا حَسَنًا وَمَا تُقَدِّمُوا لِأَنفُسِكُمْ مِنْ خَيْرٍ Whatever good you put forth for yourselves, تَجِدُوهُ عِنْدَ اللَّهِ You will find it with Allah. هُوَ خَيْرًا it was better. It will be better and it will be more rewarded than what it deserves. It will be greater with him and more rewarded than, than the action itself. Tajiduhu عند الله هو خيرا وأعظم أجرا. It will be better and even greater in reward than you could have imagined. Allah help us to strive. May help us to get this laziness off. Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al-ajzi wal-kasli wal-bukhli wal-jubni wal-haram. Naam. He says, فَحَمِدَتْ عُقْبَاهُ And so his end was praiseworthy. And that's what it's about. It's not about now. It's not about the pain now. It's not about the difficulty now. It's going to be difficult. لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ A man was created to endure. You're going to endure right now. But the end, how's the end going to be? It's going to be tough right now. Don't expect ease right now. This, this dunya was not created for ease. It was created for work. The hereafter was created for ease. Allah is going to let us be served and we get a chance to relax. No? And so the end was praiseworthy. It was pleasing. It was good. وَحَصَلَ لَهَا كُلَّ مَا تَتَمَنَّاهُ And everything that those people could have imagined of the goodness they could get, they got it. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna edit or correct, if we can do that, Imam Sa'idi here, and not just what they imagined, but beyond 
what they could have imagined. And I'm sure that's what he intended here. They're going to get beyond what they imagined. And if we can't imagine how good Allah is going to treat us if we do what he says. Look at how good he is to, this dun to us in this dunya. And we disobey him. Look at how kind he is to us, how good he is to us in this dunya, and we disobey him. How much fine foods and comforts he gives us. He answers our dua when we call on him. How much good does he do for us in this dunya and we disobey him? How kind, how much kind. And, and, and the Kafir share in this with us. The disbelievers share this with us. You know, what exclusive goodness if he's going, is he going to give to the believers who strive for him, who push themselves for him? May Allah help us to remember these realities and help us to push ourselves harder. Now, وَذَلِكَ أَنَّهَا فِي جَنَّةً That's because it's in Jannah. That's why it's going to be better. That's why it's going to be so nice. That's why they're going to be so happy. Because it's in Jannah. جَامِعَةٍ لِأَنْوَاعِ نَعِيمٍ Jannah that is inclusive of all types of pleasures and comforts and doesn't come with the, with the negativity. Every good thing that a person enjoys in this dunya comes with what? Negativity. The good friends that you have, what's the negativity? You got to die. The friends that you have in this dunya, you got to leave them. No matter how much you love them, how much you care about them. No matter how fine your car is, it's going to what? It's going to wear down and get old. No matter how strong you feel with this body, it's going to get weak. One day you're not going to do the things you was able to do. You bully people at, when you was young, one day you're going to be bullied. You're going to depend on other people one day to take care of you. There's no goodness. The food that we eat that tastes so good. Huh? What happens after that? We know what happens after that. And that's if we're in good. It could happen another way. You get sick in your stomach and then you get diarrhea or whatever else. Nothing good in this dunya lasts. It's all connected with some type of negativity. Being married is a wonderful experience. But you got to deal with each other. That ain't always easy. It's not always easy to deal with, with another person. And their attitudes and their opinions and whatnot. But what? You learn to tolerate it. You learn to have patience with it. Why? Because we've got to live together. No. But in Jannah, there's no, there's no, no, no negativity. All of it's positive. No arguments no more. huh? <laughs> no bad situations. Allah help us. Uh, inclusive of all types of pleasures and comforts. So first we have pleasure on the faces, on the inside, and the outside of the individual. And Allah is going to describe these pleasures. And what you, again, what we want to do is when we look at these pleasures, not only do we want to imagine it, but again, these pleasures, because the details are, any to know all the specifics is too much. And these are hints to the different types of pleasures. So first is pleasure on the inside. The faces on the outside, and the hearts on the inside, and the bodies are going to be feeling pleasure. And then it says, Fi jannatin aliyah, in high jannat, in, in lofty, they're going to be on high. He says, Fi mahalliha wa manaziliha, yani jannah itself is high. It's above, it's underneath the throne of Allah. And the homes in jannah are high, are raised, are lofty. He says, فَمَحَلُّهَا فِي أَعْلَى إِلِّيِّينَ Jannah is the highest. It's as high as you can get. He says, وَمَنَازِلُهَا مَسَاكِنُ عَلِيَ And the residences are, are, are high up, are raised up. لَهَا غُرَفْ مِنْ فَوْقِهَا غُرَفْ Yani there are غُرَفْ غُرَفْ are raised high level Residences. You stay at a hotel. Where's the best place to stay in the hotel? The penthouse. Where's the penthouse? On the top, right? The penthouse on the top. Yeah? That's what everybody's going to have in Jannah. They're going to they're gonna be on the top. They're going to be on the bottom floors, huh? That's the ghuraf. 
ghuraf, min fawqiha ghuraf. And even those homes for different people is going to be different levels. It's going to be different levels. And everyone's going to be high in their own homes, but some of those homes are going to be above other homes. And here he's referring to the ayat in Surah Zumar, chapter number 39 of the Quran. And if you read his tafsir of that ayat, I want to say, yeah, I, I, I want to say it's 16, but I'm not sure. But if you read the tafsir of that ayat, then it mentions there, he does tafsir, he explains what that means, what the ghuraf means, and that they are those types of dwellings. Type, what's the benefit of living in the penthouse? Now, the penthouse has all the space of the entire, of all the, 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 the square area there. But what else do you get at the penthouse? The view. You get to look down at everything else and what you want to do today and what you're going to enjoy. And so your eyes get to have pleasure too. And so from the, from the pleasures of being that high up is what? Is to be able to look out at what Allah has given you and what you want to enjoy today. You look outside, I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. I'm going to do that. Just looking at it and seeing it all just makes a person feel proud and happy. This is mine. Even without enjoying it, just looking at it is enjoying. So Allah created us, right? So he knows what we like. And so he's given us those high houses, the penthouse, huh? So we can look down and enjoy that too. Allah is going to let us enjoy every aspect of things. And so a person has to stay on the bottom floor of the hotel in this dunya, don't worry about it. Get a penthouse in the hereafter, huh? They get the penthouse in the dunya. We get in the hereafter. Got to work for it, though. Huh? He says, Mabniyatun yashrifuna minha ala ma a'addallahu lahum min al-karama. He says, they overlook from it what Allah has prepared for them of honor and goodness. They get to overlook from those high dwellings they get to overlook everything that Allah has prepared for them. Everything that Allah has given just for them, themselves, they get to see it. They get to look at it. They can open up the curtains, huh? Look over. It's mine. Alhamdulillah. Huh? You're going to praise in Allah. MashaAllah. A whole lot. Yeah? He then goes to another surah. He goes to surati uh, al haqa which shares the same ayat. Uh, or share, shares the same fi jannatin aliha, qutufu hadaniya. Yani its pickings, the pickings of its fruit, are going to be low. Yani in spite of the fact of how high they may be at any given point in time, whenever they want any fruit on any tree that belongs to them, that tree will bend and lean towards them so they can have it. They don't need to reach up or climb up. Go get it and reach around and get some type of pole to knock it down. No. The tree will lean towards them and lower itself towards them. He says, I kathira tul fawakih al-ladhidha al-ladhidha al-muthmira. He says it'll be a tree which is full of delicious fruits, that is full of fruit itself. Muthmira bithimar, full of fruits. Al-hasana of wonderful types of and delicious fruits. As-sahla at easy to reach, easy to grasp. Bihaythu, yunalunaha, they will be given those fruits. Ala ayyi halan kanu, in any situation they, ha they are. If they're leaning down, sitting down, relax, recline, the tree's going to bend to them. They don't have to make any effort to pick it. You say, why all of that? Why are the tree going to bend down? Why do they don't have to make any effort? Because they made the effort here. That's again, the reward goes with, with the effort, with the work. A person makes an effort here, and Allah saves them from what? Having to make an effort in the here. You don't make any effort in the hereafter, because you did all the work here. None. Allah help us. Allah help us to strive. Well, I, we need to read these types of tafsir and, and contemplate on them. You know, a person should, well, I, if we had the time and Allah didn't bless, if Allah saved us from being so lazy, and we should read this like every morning, huh? Just to get motivated, you know? This is... A, this is, this is the plan for the day. This is what I'm trying to get. Allahu Akbar. Now, 
He says, لا يحتاجون أن يسعدوا شجرة أو يستعصي عليهم منها ثمرة. They don't have to climb any trees and no fruit is going to be difficult or hard or out of their reach. He says, لا تسمع فيها لاغية. They won't hear in Jannah any lagia. So we've gone from the eyes now and now we're going to the ears. Their ears are going to hear things that are pleasing to them. They're not going to hear any lagia. What is lagia? He says, أي كلمة لغو وباطل فضلا عن الكلام المحرم. They're not going to hear any non-beneficial, baseless, false, horrible, ugly speech, let alone anything haram. They're not going to hear anything ugly, anything that would be displeasing to them, anything that's not beneficial to them, or anything that's haram. And subhanAllah, in he contemplating on this, can somebody say something to you and just ruin your day? Like you was having a good day, and then someone comes and says one thing to you, and it just what? Ruins your day. Could be a conversation you had before you left the house, could be something you heard at work, could be something you heard on the news, could be something someone screamed at you out the car. Just one thing, and your whole day is what? Messed up, gone. Just my mood is ruined. It's not gonna be any of that on the day of judgment. No one's gonna ruin your mood on the day of judgment. We gotta tolerate it here and be patient with it here. But on the day of judgment, no one's gonna ruin your mood. No one's gonna mess up your good day. No one's gonna spoil it. Allahu Akbar. Uh, we gotta deal with it now. Here we gotta be patient. And just be careful not to respond back. Just keep that mouth shut for the sake of Allah. Whoever believes in Allah on the day of judgment, let him speak well or do what? Keep his mouth shut. We're not doing it because we're weak. We're not doing it because we can't think of something smart and witty to say. We're doing it why? We, we hold in our mouths why? Because we want to go to Jannah. We want Allah to be pleased with us. We want to see it in the scales. We want those, we want the penthouse. Allah We want the penthouse, Brother Hanif, don't we? That's right. We want the penthouse, mashallah. MashaAllah. Now, he says, Bel kalamuhu kalamun hasanun nafi. He said, Their speech is all good and beneficial speech. You're going to be speaking well, and the people who are around you are only going to be saying good and positive and nice things to you. Because hearing nice things makes you what? Feel good. If somebody wants to play you and get over on you, run a, run a con on you, first thing you're going to do is what? Compliment you. The good in that hat, man. You know? <laughs> they borrow a couple of dollars, right? They're gonna say something nice. Why? Get you in a good mood. Some good speech makes you feel good. That's the idea. We we this is how Allah created us. We fail to remember I any mean, all these things. And, and, and people who know this take advantage of people in this way. If I make you feel good, you what? You open up. That's the idea. Allah created us where words affect us. And our eyes affect us. It, it, it affects how we feel. And so a person who is true to himself is going to be very careful with what he lets himself see and what he lets himself hear. Because he knows what he sees and what he hears is going to do what? It's going to affect him. And if we want to be better believers, we got to be conscious about what we're watching and what we're listening to because it affects us. As we just said, you can hear something and it, your day is gone because of something you heard. And sometimes our iman can fall because we were in a conversation where someone was talking bad about somebody else. And now we just don't feel good anymore. Our whole iman, we just feel grimy because of some conversations that we have with people. We got to be conscious of the things that we allow ourselves to listen to in this dunya and the things that we allow ourselves to watch. No. No. He says, Mushtamilun ala dhikrillah. He says, speech that has the remembrance of Allah. Wa dhikri ni'mihi al mutawatira. Speech that has continuous, any that mentions Allah's continuous blessings. Alayhim. And speech that, that, in, that involves good character and good etiquette. This speech, it makes them feel happy inside, makes them feel good, makes them comfortable. That's all they're going to hear 
in Jannah. Tayyip, we're four minutes before the, uh, before the, uh, four minutes before the Adhan, for Salat al-Maghrib, at least according to where we are here. Uh, and so I think while we're just stopped on what we hear and what we see, let's stop there and we'll pick up, inshallah, next week and look some more at Jannah. I think if we can start next week talking about Jannah too, that's, that's a good place to start, huh? Now, may Allah bless us with Jannah. May Allah help us to strive for Jannah. Again, if we take away any way, anything today, let's focus on that ayah, li sa'ayiha radiya. Pleased with their striving. Pleased with their hard work. That's what we have to be doing now. Nothing is free. Nothing in life is free. And nothing in the hereafter is free either. Jannah costs. Allah is the most merciful. And Jannah is not free. Allah is the most merciful. And Jannah is not free. Ala inna sil'at Allahi ghaliya. Ala inna sil'at Allahi jannah Allah's commodity is expensive. Allah's commodity is Jannah. May Allah bless us with the efforts. May he bless us with the efforts to get to Jannah. And may he make us each, every one of us, may he make us pleased with the efforts that he blesses us to do. And may he make us of the children of the hereafter. May he make us of those who think about the hereafter all the time here. And because of that, they work for it. Subhanallah wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasleeman kathira. Alhamdulillah.